بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد moving forward إمام زهير بن حرب رحمه الله تعالى he then goes on to quote we move on to أثر number 96 if I'm not mistaken or it's Athar no we're past 96 we finished that tell you uh, Athar number 97 the Imam Zuhair bin Harb rahimahullah he says Hadathna Abu Khaythama Khala Hadathna Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi An Hamad ibn Zayd An Ayyub anuhu Khala Khala Rajlun Limutarrif Afdal min al-Qur'ani Turidun Khala la ولكن نريد من هو أعلم بالقرآن منا. إمام زهير بن حرب narrates from عبد الرحمن بن مهدي from حماد بن زيد from أيوب من أيوب ابن أبي تميم السختياني. he said that a man said to مطرف من مطرف ابن عبد الله ابن الشخير رحمه الله. he said to him you want other than the Quran you want something better than the Quran? Afdalu min al Quran? You want something afdal min al Quran? And in most cases, what's meant here is yani, the Sunnah. You writing down hadiths, recording hadiths, traveling for hadiths. You want something more than the Quran? What, what could you possibly get other than the Quran? Of ilm, of guidance, of rulings. And Mutarif, rahimahullah ta'ala, he answered the man, he says, No. That's not the case. We don't want other than the Quran. We're not looking for guidance other than the Qur'an. He says, but we want someone who knows the Qur'an better than us. We want someone who has a better understanding of the Qur'an than we do. The fa'idah from this athar, that's the meaning of it. And the fa'idah, and he meant by that the messenger of Allah, the sunnah, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu give us a better understanding of the Qur'an than ourselves, or this one, or that one, or third and a fourth. That's the meaning of the athar. As far as the fa'idah of the athar, then it shows us and it teaches us the importance of the sunnah and the status of the sunnah and the necessity of the sunnah. Secondly, it shows that the true alim is to be wise and witty. And he isn't supposed to fall victim to a trap that someone comes and lays for him. A set up question or a loaded question. Do not fall for the propaganda and never ever bite the bait that your enemy throws you. Never. Never take the worm that's floating in the water because behind that worm is a sharp metal hook. And unfortunately, we live in a time in 2020 in which there are people who take loaded questions. They answer the loaded question. They take it for face value. They give a general blank yes or no answer. And as if they just swallow up the slop. As if they swallow up the slop that the opponent is trying to feed them. Do you believe this? Is this kether? Does Islam allow this? And that's it. And regardless of the details that are needed, is there khilaf? Is it proof? Is it in the Quran? Hadith? Regardless, they just take the loaded question and they answer it in a loaded manner. Allahu alam, who knows the intentions? Only Allah knows what's behind the, 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 the skin and the fat and the muscle and the bones. Allah alam what's in the breast, what's in the heart of, of, of a nas. Who knows? Except for Allah. But it's a problem and it wasn't necessarily the way of the Salaf al-Salih and the ulama of the past. To take someone who has a clear agenda and to answer the question in a way in which they want you to answer it. That causes harm. May Allah protect us and keep us all firm. Ameen. So he answered the man. But not the way he wanted it to be answered. La. Of course we agree that the Quran is the source of guidance. And Allah tells us which hadith, which discourse would they believe in after the Quran. That's not the case. But whose interpretation, whose understanding, whose tafsir, yours, your sheikh, your imam, your culture, or Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's an extremely important way of answering the question is to use hikmah. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he said the big idol did it. He beat them, he defeated them, he outwitted them intellectually. So never answer a loaded question in the way in which they want you to answer it because they'll take your speech, 
the Romantic speech and it'll cause harm among the Muslims and the non-Muslims alike. The people of the Sunnah and the people other than the Sunnah. People of Ilm and Hadith, those who follow you, respect you, have good thoughts of you, it's going to throw them off course. Let alone your enemies are going to rejoice. Hmm? Let that be, let those words, inshallah ta'ala, be, be pondered upon. Be idhnillah, wallahu alam. And it also goes to show us is that the people who look down upon Hadith and the tariqah of Ahl Hadith is old. It isn't something which is a, a new thing, it's old. It's very old. Wallahu alam. Moving forward. حدثنا أبو خيثماء قال حدثنا عبد الرحمن قال حدثنا أبو خلدة قال سمعت أبا عنية يقول حدث القوم ما أو ما حملوا قال قلت ما حملوا قال ما نشطوا طيب in that last أثر والله أعلم it also goes to show us is that the messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام in the Sunnah it's the peak and the pinnacle and the summit of ilm. There's no fiqh higher and greater than that. No alim is higher and greater than the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And also the danger, the severe danger, the severe danger of leaving the Quran open for anyone's interpretation. As we mentioned, the times in which we live, people want to reject the hadiths, the way they can practice a politically correct Islam, a modern Islam, a progressive Islam, and a friendly, non-Muslim, accepting and loving Islam, unfortunately. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوتَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ طيب. Moving forward. The next athar, Abu Khaytham reports from Abdul Rahman, from Abu Khalda, from Abu Ulayya, who says, Then this athar here, Allah alam, it can have more than one meaning. Perhaps it means that people who are the youngest from among the people hadath al qawm it can be hadath al qawm or in most cases hadath al qawm yani hadath al qawmi allah alam is more than one way of understanding it in arabic and translating it wallahu ta'ala alam perhaps it means he says ma nashatu allah alam was the murad of this athar it doesn't make or break anything and it isn't something which is a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Establishing a major rule of halal haram, Allah's names and attributes, something that we have to understand and we have to interpret and we have to implement. Wallahu a'lam. Moving on to Athar number 99. Hadathan Abu Khaythama, Qala Hadathan Abdul Rahman, An Shu'abata, An Nabi Ishaqa, Qala Simitu Abu Lahwas Yukulu, Kana Abdullah Yukulu, La Tumil Al Nas. Narrated Abu Khaythama from Abdul Rahman, from Shu'aba, from Abu Ishaq. Who said, I heard Abu Al-Ahwas reporting from Abdullah, meaning Ibn, Ab Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. He said, La tumillu nas Do not bore the people. Do not push the people away by burdening them and overburdening them and giving them too much. And inshallah ta'ala here, Abdullah is Ibn Mas'ud, bi'idhanillah. We've explained the meaning of this type of athar, along with the hadith of the Prophet sallam, of Ibn Mas'ud, Kana Rasulullah sallam yatakhawaluna bil mawidat مَخَافَتَ أَسَأَمَتِ عَلَيْنَا أو كما قال رضي الله عنه that the Prophet ﷺ used to give us admonishments and reminders sparingly here and there not to bore us and overburden us ETC we've explained that before in detail and the danger of overburdening the people and bothering the people and treating the layman people like students of knowledge and also on the reverse who is treating students of knowledge like layman people those who are hungry those who want the knowledge every day. Those who want the reminder every day. Those who want the ta'lim every day. So a critical mistake can be made on either of the two directions. To treat the, gym, the layman people like tulab al ilm Stuffing things down their throats. Giving them too much. Giving things that are above them. Beyond their pay grade. And also treating people who are on a higher level. And have a greater thirst for knowledge. And a greater raghba for ilm. Saying, oh I don't want to bore you. I don't want to give you too much. And they're saying, give us the knowledge, sheikh. Teach us. We want the class every day. We want the reminder after each salah. We want the, the, the jalasat. So the alim has to have hikmah. And he has to have fiqh of what to do and what not to do. And both sides are going to be bad. Okay? Uh, both sides of extremism. Moving forward. Hadathana Abu Khaythama. We're on ethel number 100. Hadathana Abdurrahman. Qala hadathana Sharik. An Simak. An Jabir ibn Samurata anhu qala. 
كنا إذا انتهينا إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم جلس أحدنا حيث ينتهي أبو خيثم رحمه الله ناريت from عبد الرحمن from شريك from سماك from جابر بن سمرة who said that whenever the messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام whenever we want to sit with him whenever we 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 got to him uh, we would sit حيث ينتهي wherever the majlis was wherever the majlis had ended okay wherever the majlis had ended meaning the people they wouldn't jump from this place to that place they would sit according to that which was easy that which was convenient they wouldn't take people's places they wouldn't push each other kick each other so on and so forth uh, and this athar isnad is not necessarily the most authentic isnad some of these people here, there's يعني فيه كلام شريك بن عبد الله النخعي سماك right etc. كلام about that isnad the adab the etiquette of sitting is the the was intent, intended by this hadith and this athar the etiquette of sitting and there is a way of sitting in the class and there is a way of not sitting in the class. Uh, of course, we know as we have explained what what Allah Hamdulillah that people should come close and we've also explained the difference between the sunnah and the adab you'll find this in the kalam of some of the salaf salih there's a sunnah and then there is an adab something we have directly from the messenger of Allah versus something which is a cultural adab which isn't a bad thing and it's a manifestation of respect and good manners so sticking your feet towards the qibla or sticking your feet towards your teacher is not necessarily the most respect. Raising your left hand for your teacher in a class is not necessarily the most respect. But it doesn't mean it's haram. And it doesn't mean that it's makruh. Because that's a hukum shar'i that needs a dalil from Quran and Sunnah to prove. But the adab, sitting in the classes, sitting with the scholars overseas, you don't come and stick your feet in someone's face. That's rude. That's, 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 just, that's not manifesting humility. Also the concept of shoes. Bringing your shoes in someone's house, bringing your shoes on someone's carpet is not necessarily a manifestation of respect. But it doesn't mean that you can't wear shoes in the masjid. It doesn't mean that you can't wear shoes in your house. That is makruh. Karaha and tahrim, there's hukum shari'i. That needs dalil. But culturally, if it doesn't go against the text and it's a manifestation of respect, tayyib. Tayyib. As long as it doesn't go against the text. So if I'm from Japan, and if in Japan, for you to bring your shoes in someone's house is ultimate disrespect. For you to sit down and eat with your shoes on is of ultimate disrespect. And there's nothing that goes against it in the Quran and Sunnah. I'm a Japanese Muslim. I'm a revert Muslim. Or second generation Japanese Muslim. La bas. La mushkila. No problem. As long as it doesn't go against the Kitab and Sunnah. You cannot pray in your shoes because you're in Japan. You should not pray in your shoes. La 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 la. No. No and no. Ancestors, the culture of Japan, la abadan. But we're not talking about the prayer. We're talking about sitting down. We're talking about the class. That's a different story. So sticking your feet towards your teacher is a very, very common mistake that many brothers make. They make this mistake. They stick their feet towards the brothers in the class. They put their feet out, and that's extremely rude. Or other brothers, they eat in the class. They eat in front of you. Allahu musta'an. Or they'll be drinking something other than water or some tea that you serve. That's that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Let alone people lay back. People may snore. They may sleep, etc. And all of these things, they're not to be blamed upon the layman people in the class. But some of those things are the faults of the teacher. And that's because you have to understand that you're not talking to tulabul in. So maybe the class is too long. The people's attention span aren't that, isn't that long. So there's a difference. But we're talking about the professional student of knowledge. The one who's trying to be elite. The one who's يعني, aspiring to be a talib al -in. How can you sit with your feet towards your teacher? How can you call your teacher by his first name? How can you do this and make this type of joke or, or make this hand expression towards your teacher? That's rude. It's disrespectful. You cannot do it. How can you be sitting against the wall saying that you want to go to Medina? Alright, so there's an adab of sitting. There's an adab of asking questions. There's an adab of leaving, seeking permission, etc., etc., etc. That's what's meant here. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Moving forward, Athar number 101. 
حدثنا أبو خيثمة قال حدثنا عبد الرحمن السليمان بن المغيرة عن ثابت عن عمرو بن شعيب أنه قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يكره أن يوطى عقبه ولكن عن يمين وشمال أبو خيثمة نعرف اسم عبد الرحمن from سليمان ابن مغيرة from ثابت from عمرو بن شعيب who reported that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was never fond of people walking behind him He didn't like people walking behind him, following him, but either on the right side or on the left side. Either on the right side or on the left side. Sheikh Al-Albani says in the footnotes, Hadith on Sahih on wa isnaduhu mursalun, lakin wasalahu al-hakimu min tariqi Umayyata ibn Khalid in Khal Hadithna Suleyman ibn Mughira an Thabit an Amr ibn Shu'ib an Abihi an Abdullah ibn Amr an Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم وصحوا على شرط مسلم وافقوا الذهبي وانما هو صحيح فقط He says that this athar, its chain of narration is not authentic because it's mursal, Amr ibn Shu'ib is not a companion Amr ibn Shu'ib narrates from his father who narrated from his huh, father Amr ibn Shu'ib's grandfather Amr ibn Shu'ib an Abihi an his, his grandfather an Jaddihi Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As and the ulama have discrepancies on that isnad is it authentic what's meant by his father his grandfather etc the khulasa here is that when the chain is connected it's Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As may Allah be well pleased with him who's one of the companions who is a prolific hadith narrator he was under a thousand but in several hundred hadiths Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As narrated famous famous uh, companion of son of the companion the prolific hadith narrator here Amr ibn Shu'ib is narrating directly from the Prophet so it's mursal it's mu'adal it's munqata it's not muttasil alright and Shaykh Abani says that there are other places in which this isnad is continued it's muttasil it's mawsul so this isnad is daif and other isnads that are authentic that's what Shaykh Abani says and that's his view regarding this hadith regarding this hadith what's important is many of the salaf salih they warned from people walking behind you and following you. Uh, and some of them they would say, فَإِنَّهُ مَذِلَّ They say, It's humiliation for the follower walking and running behind someone and it could be a means of fitna for the one being followed. All oh, these people are following me. All right, many of the pious predecessors they warned against this. If you have to walk with an alim to ask him a question or to read books to him or to get an ijaza or to get a fatwa, they say walk with him and not behind him because it can be a means of infatuation, a means of fitna, in which a person's head begins to swell and which a person could be humiliating himself. Now, Sheikh Al Bani, rahimahullah, here as we've just read, he holds the view that the hadith is a sahih. As far as those who say that it's not sahih and it's not from the kalam of the Rasul and it's only in the mayathbut manqufan or maqtu'an it's from the kalam of the tabi'een maybe some of the companions then it doesn't take the same ruling as the Prophet sallallahu saying for a person said it's haram and dislike to walk behind a scholar there may be a time which is a large group and you can't walk on the side of him and wallahi I've seen this countless times in Medina Countless times, a teacher, a professor, Sheikh Abdul Muhsan al Abad, so many people follow him, asking him, this Sheikh, that Sheikh, all walking him to the car, walking him to the parking lot, walking him to the office, walking him to the musalla, and what you have to hear and, and almost fight to listen to get the fa'idah from what the Sheikh is saying. Wallahu ta'ala alam. What's important is, just like there's an etiquette and adab of sitting with an alim, there's an adab of walking with an alim. And this is the purpose of us teaching these books. Is to finely tune and to lay down the culture of Talabul Ilm. The culture, the sophistication of Talabul Ilm. The finely tuning of the knob and not just a student of knowledge. I went overseas, I came back. But with someone, a walking, talking Talabul Ilm that has from A to Z all of the adab, madbuta, mundabita, clearly laid out, in which we have a finely tuned. Finally, Sith detailed system of culture and sophistication and reaching the pinnacle of Talib al and how to be a professional student of knowledge and not just the umumat, the general things, the mutlaqat, 
the general things, have respect, have ikhlas, that's general. And that's important, but that's not the sophistication. So this is what we mean, we mean the culture of talab, the disciplism, the disciplism. Wallahu ta'ala ala. moving forward. Athar number 102, Hadathan Abu Khaythama, Qala Hadathan Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, An Zaidata, An Ata ibn Sa'ibi, Qala, Kana Abu Abdul Rahman yakrahu, An Yus'ala, Wa huwa yamshi. The next Athar, Abu Khaythama narrates from Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, from Zaida, from Ata ibn Sa'ib, who said that Abu Abdul Rahman was un, or he wasn't fond of, he disliked, he didn't. He wasn't too fond of the idea of a man being asked a question while ask while walking. While being while walking, huh? And there are some many of the the, the tabi'in. They had the name of Abu Abdurrahman. Many companions had the kunni Abu Abdurrahman as well. The ta'yin of this Abu Abdurrahman, bil jazm, decisively saying who is Allah alam. What's important is some of the salaf, they dislike this. Don't ask a man a question while he's walking. And the reason why they disliked that is that they thought that the person couldn't concentrate and he couldn't give the full haq to the fatwa, the full haq to the answer while walking, meaning he's preoccupied. Okay, Imam al Bukhari, rahimahullah, in his Kitab al Ilm, he mentions several chapters about giving a fatwa while standing, the Prophet وسلم, at Mina, on his riding beast, so on and so forth. So it's not haram, it's not haram. And for it to be makru, disliked, once more we need a dalil shar'i, we need a hadith, proof. As far as an adab, tarku awla, it's best not to, then perhaps. And what's important is, is that they wanted to give the full amount of respect to speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the maqsood, huh, brothers and sisters. Athar number 103. Hadathana Abu Khaythama. Qala hadathana Abdul Rahman. An Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. An Rabah ibn Ziyad. Or Riyah ibn Ziyad. عن رجل عن ابن منبه أنه قال إن للعلم تغيانا كتغيان المال أبو خيث ما نعرف من عبد الرحمن من عبد الله بن مبارك من رياح ابن زيد من a man who said that uh, ابن منبه uh, and of course there are two we have وهب ابن منبه and we have همام ابن منبه both of them from the tabi'een great tabi'een uh, some scholars mention the lineage and the background of of, of for sure, one of the two, Allah Alam, if it's not both of them, they used to be from uh, the Jews or the Christians, and they had then accepted Islam and came to Islam, and they had knowledge of the previous scriptures of the Torah and the Injil. Okay, Wahhab ibn Munabih, and uh, well, of course, we have Hamam ibn Munabih, he's the Sahib al Sahifa to Sahiha, one of the earliest known preserved scripts and manuscripts and scrolls of Hadith. From Abu Huraira that has survived to this day. And Imam Muhammad has collected the whole entire Sahifa in his Muslim. Over 200 ahadith. Huh? Moving forward. He said that knowledge in the lil ilmi tughyanan. There's from knowledge that which can make a person to be haughty. And that which can make a person to be arrogant and pompous and conceited. He starts smelling himself just like wealth. Just like money. Rich people act a certain way, not all, not all, but many, if not most. When they have money, they start walking differently, they look differently. The money changes the person's appearance, no doubt. You talk about pop culture, media, this rapper, this actor, his first album, his first movie, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, how he looked, the album cover, is not 20 years later, after this person became a conglomerate, a giant in the music industry and the acting industry the money makes them look different they takes they, they 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 talk differently their skin is different it's not the same anymore let alone their behavior how they carry themselves they don't give this person they don't speak to this person they don't go here they don't visit this person they look down on these fans the fans that made them listen carefully the fans that made them who they are they start mistreating them and ignoring them and looking down upon them that's a problem that all comes from money, let alone a person being an aristocrat, in which this person's money is new. You just got rich. You just struck for oil. You just found oil. You just came into money first generation. Me? My great-grandfather was rich. My great-great-great-grandfather was an aristocrat. 
was a leader, was a ambassador, was a vizier or vizier or wazir. It was a, a, a minister to the king, a minister to the sultan. I come from royalty. I come from royalty. Money, my money is old. My parents, they got money in the Rockefeller age. Okay, early 1900s, late 1800s, this and that. That's not the same as someone who's, who just came into money. And the new money, the person is still humble. They still eat humbly. They still travel humbly. They still respect people. They still have compassion for poor people. Versus the one that's three or four or five generations of a silver spoon. They, they behave differently. They don't speak to commoners. They don't talk to peasants. They don't want peasants in their company. Versus the one who just got rich 20 years ago. Or 10 years ago. Or last year. They still sit and talk and laugh with the peasants. Because they used to be peasants themselves. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very deep and profound concept right there in itself. So money causes people to have to rien, to overstep the boundaries and arrogance and pride. And this ethical says that knowledge can do the same. Allahu Akbar. You don't have the knowledge to ask me this question. You're not qualified to do this. Get out of my face and tell this. Or if the person doesn't verbalize how they behave and how they look down upon people and scorn people and talk about people and make fun of people. Mm, beware, O student of knowledge. Be careful. Be careful, O seeker of knowledge, of you being afflicted by the Turian of Idin. You memorized a few things now. Okay, you came back your first year after Medina. Your first year, you're back from Egypt. Your first year back from Yemen. Now you want to look down upon people. You scorn people. You start looking at the mistakes of people. Talking about this person's Arabic. His Quran is messed up. You start talking about your old teachers. You start talking about the masjids. La, 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 ya Be humble. Be careful. You just got knowledge. Just yesterday, you were sitting at that person asking him questions. And now, he's a deviant now. I learned something. I sat with this scholar. He's a deviant. He's not Salafi. He's a deviant. I have nothing to do with him. And he was just teaching you. And other people, many people, they do things like this. They're talking about a teacher. A teacher makes a mistake. Let's say a teacher falls into a sin on social media. Or some scandal with a woman. Or if it's not a son. And it's not a scandal. But it's just what you think. Or half the story that you heard. And then you start reprimanding your teacher. Talking about your teacher. Disrespecting your teacher. And just yesterday you didn't know the basics of this. Just yesterday you couldn't read that. Just yesterday you had to ask basic life saving questions to this teacher. And he was there for you. And he answered those questions. He taught you. He was patient upon your slow learning. Now you understand a thing, you read a thing, and you look down and you start talking down to that teacher. In the little ilmi and that's very, very dangerous, and it's a trick, a subtle trick of shaitan, and the seeker of knowledge has to be careful. And Allah is no doubt that when a person has knowledge of Islam, he's memorized the Quran, he's learning, he's a graduate, it comes with status. It comes with pomp, it comes with glitter. Women are going to throw themselves at you. Masters are begging you to come speak, come talk. They want to hire you. They want to give you money. Come visit us. We'll pay for your plane tickets. We'll give you an honorarium. Kether, 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 kether. Status is born. You become a star, a celebrity. Online. Instagram, Facebook, social media, YouTube. You become a celebrity. Viral video. Just imagine that. You have one video. A million people saw your video. 10 million people. 100 million people. Let it on. 100 people. 500 people. 1,000 people. 5,000 people. How many views on one video? 50,000 people, 90, 100,000 people saw your khutbah and listened. That gives you status. So it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And of course, it's easy for a person to say, oh, Fulan is sold out. Fulan is arrogant. Oh, Fulan is too big for us. Fulan is a big shot. You can say that, but you're not in that situation. And what you're in a room of 500 people, 1,000 people, 3,000 people, and they're all looking at you, listening to you. And you're in a room of 5,000, 10,000 in an arena, a stadium. And you're the most knowledgeable person from among them. It's easy for you to say. So you have to seek Allah's refuge. You have to seek Allah's protection. And you have to constantly check your niya and ask yourself, who am I doing it for? What am I doing it for? And humble yourself. Every now and then, you got to take a spoon of bitter medicine. Take a slice of humble pie. There's someone who doesn't respect you the proper way. Someone who doesn't give you your full status. There's a student who's rambunctious, who's talking back, or has a full cup. Every now and then, you do stuff and you make sure that you travel and you go here without no honorarium. You do a fee sabi to that 100%.
not saying that if you get paid for your services as an imam or a scholar or a lecturer that it's not fi sabilillah. Many people they think that's wrong too. Hadi ghalta, that's wrong. You can fight in Allah's cause and still get spoils of war. Doesn't mean that it's for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man qata, man qata li takuna kalimatullahi al-ulya. Fahi fi sabilillah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. But I'm talking about make sure that you you give a percentage of stuff in which you're not getting nothing for. You give a percentage of classes in which you don't 500 people sitting in front of you. Five people, one person. Every now and then you got to pay tax to humble yourself. That's the point that I'm trying to get to. And that's because in can have tughyan. Like wealth can have tughyan. And this is extremely dangerous. And we have to be careful, especially in the age of social media. The age of social media. That is so easy to become popular. So easy to become famous. So easy to get millions of followers. You have to check your intentions. And you have to physically practice humility. And the last thing that I'll say is be careful of telling other people that they're arrogant and they don't have humility. That's not your job to determine what's in a person's heart. That's not your job to tell the learned person, the alim, or your personal teacher, or the one who used to be your teacher, oh, you're not doing something. That's not your job. You don't know what's in that person's heart. Nasiha for everyone, yes. Nasiha for all the Muslims. Adin or Nasiha. But it's not your job to check on someone's niyyah in their heart. We ask Allah Azza wa for protection from all of these vices and all of these cancers. We ask Allah to give us a success in our seeking of knowledge and our teaching of knowledge. Wallahu ta'ala alam.